Hi everybody, welcome to another super fun mini lecture. Now the semester is actually winding down. Uh, in fact, if we were actually in class, we'd be doing uh, role plays in our final projects by this point. So we're going to have to do that uh, uh, via video. So get ready to uh, find a partner, somebody in your life to do a role play with, but I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of um, coursework is something that's not really covered in the book too much, but it's the whole idea of counselor and counseling ethics, what you can and can't do. Every uh, profession has a, uh, uh, has a code of ethics. Uh, myself, as a credential alcohol and substance abuse counselor, I have to go by and know a code of ethics. And social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists and doctors all have different codes of ethics. Most of them share the same characteristics. One, you never do any harm to a client. Well, that should be obvious, right? Um, two, you don't ever exceed your expertise or what you're capable of doing. So if, for instance, I'm a trained credentialed addictions counselor. Doesn't mean I should be having a private practice on eating disorders or uh, on anxiety or depression. My field is addiction. Okay. Uh, the idea of payment. How do you charge and what do you charge and what can you take from a client? Well, of course, it's ethical to charge a, a fee to a client, but what if a client wants to give you a gift? Is that okay? Well, most people say no. I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. If you have had a client for a long stretch of time and they graduate and they want to give you a small token of their gratitude, like a pen or a notebook or something like that, I think you can accept something like that. On the other hand, if somebody wants to give you a car, that's probably not okay. What about relationships and clients? Is it ever appropriate to have a relationship with a client. Well, let's first talk about friendships. You should always keep a distance uh, between you and your clients. Now, what happens in the 12-step programs? Many people who are in recovery go to 12-step meetings, and then they see clients, maybe even active clients, at the same meetings. What do you do about that? Well, for that reason, many people in recovery go to meetings in a different town so they don't run into clients. Should you have to do that? No, you don't have to do that, but it might be more comfortable. Um, if you are at a meeting with somebody you are uh, counseling at the same time, maybe say hello, share a greeting, and then get on to something else. But you really have to examine that thought process and what you want to do and what meetings you want to go to. In everyday life, <clears throat> you're at the mall and you see walking towards you uh, a client, uh, either present or past, what do you do? Well, I think a good rule of thumb is to wait for them to say hello to you, particularly if they're with another person. Think about it if you say, if you're the counselor and you say, hey, Joe, how's it going? And they're with a friend. And then somebody has to say, how, how, do, you ha how do you happen to know that guy? And then it forces a whole conversation. So that's a, that's a thing to consider. The idea of uh, romantic and sexual relationships. What do we uh, have to say about that? Well, obviously, I hope obviously, that's a big no-no. Yet, every single place I've worked, there's been at least a single or several incidences of people getting inappropriately involved with clients. Why does that happen? Well, you're sharing intimate information that often, as human beings, makes us feel close to people. Sometimes clients can be provocative. Clients aren't supposed to have their stuff together, so sometimes they do inappropriate things. It's very important to, for you as a counselor to be aware of your stuff, so when you know something's going on and there's transference or counter-transference. Transference is when a client puts thoughts and feelings uh, and attributes them to you, the counselor. Counter-transference is when you put thoughts and feelings that you have on the client. Maybe thoughts that you have for a mom or a dad or an ex-lover or something like that. 
have to be aware of that. It's one of the reasons we suggest people uh, never stray too far from help when they're being a counselor. So there's the obvious things about uh, sexo sexual relationships. Uh, can you ever get romantically involved with somebody you counsel? It's interesting because some places, uh, some employment places will stipulate that you have to wait two years or five years before you have a relationship with someone. Uh, to me, you really have to think about it. Uh, when you're a counselor, you're always in the one-up position from the client. Is that a good way to start a relationship? Probably not. And um, really have to look at how you could get involved with the client. Yet, like I said before, it happens a lot. And that's a shame. What about uh, doing business with clients? Suppose uh, somebody was in your care, they graduate, they finish treatment, they terminate appropriately, and they're a mechanic, and you uh, need some car work done. Can you bring it to that guy? You're better off not, right? What if the guy needs the work? What if uh, he could use the business and you have something wrong with your car? Still a weird boundary, something you probably shouldn't do. Okay. Um, so all of the ethical things are around boundaries, right? And um, you want to keep a professional boundary with, uh, with the person that you're working with. So obviously that means relationships, that means business, that means money. That means your own boundary in terms of expertise and what you can do.